the thing that is sorry to interrupt you which um you know the the stories of of you know there's a bunch of stories like uh when it when it was when it said oh i'll just emulate a linux computer for you <laughs> completely with screenshots and commands and directory listings and yada yada right you know but um but i th i think the the real um the real experience is in a conversation that you have with it over you know over time kind of and over multiple messages so i so i agree with you and um uh, aram we're, we're the context here is i'm i've seen a couple stories float by that that are that for me sparked like the omg this chat gpt thing and allied tools are mind-blowing and are capable of super things so i'm trying to collect up some of those stories now so that i can remember later and and uh, as a sub note, Pete just sent a message to a, to a list run, and he corrected my misremembering one of those aha stories that I had heard. I had the wrong person and the wrong topic, and and all of that. So he actually did the work and found it. Um, but we're trying to figure that out. And, and so, so Pete, I I think the reason I want to collect these stories is that the best of them illustrate the progression of conversation and refinement of query that happens in a really good quest that leads to some really amazing results. And I'm hoping to save and share those stories out to inspire people to actually try harder and have the experience you just described. Me meaning it's, 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 it's like riding a bicycle. I can show you videos, yeah. I can tell you the physics, and until you ride the bike, you don't know how to ride a bike. I think yeah. ChatGPT is the same. I, I yeah. agree. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Pete. I I agree, and you can't actually show them the output. It it's not the same as having gone through the discovery process of getting, you know, get, having the conversation. It's it's like riding a bicycle or whatever. Yep. Um. But that said, we we do we do have tutorials on how to ride a bicycle to try to get people to ride bicycles. Sorry, Aram. Go ahead. Yes, I am. Yeah. No, I was just gonna add. I think like a lot of the. <clears throat> chat gpt stuff has been used in like some extremely concerning ways like it's facing the same sort of problems of you know not really considering ethical oversight as it's going forward and the issues of like the the technology confidently lying to you is like very troubling to me but i do think there's a lot of potential in that style of technology for parsing specific databases and presenting information more neutrally as opposed to like trying to turn it into a conversation like i think of something like your project jerry like as a data set that could go into a machine learning system and could answer questions with the presentation of nodes from that data set as opposed to trying to turn it into some sort of small essay that could or could not be accurate and has no particular like internal methodology to tell otherwise, mm -hmm. which is sort of the opposite of, of the intent of your project. Exactly. I, I have a different experience of, of uh, working with ChatGPT, um, and it's it's in when when I'm asking it conver conversationally, um, often about something I, I know, you know, I kind of know the answer, um, but it's hard for me to articulate or hard to remember or or um, something like that, or I, I guess that's that's the the big thing. I I don't ask it to be an oracle. I ask it to have a conversation with me about you know about things. Um, uh, so uh, let me just just kind of mulling off. Um, I I added a bunch of uh, prompts that I found. Um, that were really, really informative and transformative in the way I was understanding something. Uh, so this was a simple one. It was in a conversation, text uh, text conversation at, at email thread with David Weinberger. I said, um, you know, I think about David Weinberger's, given David Weinberger's book, Everything is Miscellaneous, write a book summary for another book, Everything is Marvelous. And and it did an amazing job. Um, this is uh, this is in a conversation where we had already gone through some practice of having it summarize books. And the book that I was working on was uh, Jeff Hawkins' Thousands Brains model. Um, it, and I, I read the book. Um, 
if if I hadn't read the book, I wouldn't want to ask the things that I did. But I was trying to tell somebody else, you know, here's the gist of the book. I did a pretty good job without any AI. But then, then we got into more detail, and I knew that I could write something, but it would take me hours and hours and hours. Um, and so I could just ask it, you know, hey, in, in Jeff Hawkins' Thousand Brains model, what are reference frames? Um, and it gives a good answer. How do movement and reference frames interact, which is a big part of the answer of that in Jeff's book. And it's, and it's information that's scattered throughout the book. It's not, and, and lots of different, you know, different uh, metaphors and explanations of it. So it's not like in one place. It, it does a great job of that. Are movement and reference frames always physical or are they both physical and conceptual? Another super big part of the whole thing, which is also, again, not in any one place, but kind of holistically through, but a big holographically through a chunk of the book. Does a good job of that. Um, I, I said, okay, so I'm trying to do a metaphor for somebody to explain what a reference frame is like. Can you construct a reference frame, quote unquote, that would help a shopper evaluate ro robot vacuum cleaners? Um, and it did a great job of that. So none of those things are, tell me an answer. They're a lot more about, let's together explore a space. Um, and in a conversational mode, which as a human, me and my ancestors have been doing for a thousand generations. Um, and the experience of doing that with something that keeps up with you. Um, another another couple examples. Um, hey, there, there's that book about um, a chorus of minds or something. It's by Minsky. Um, it says, oh, you're talking about Marvin Minsky, a society, the Society of Mind. Um, so, okay, compare and contrast the Society of Mind and Jeff Hawkins' Thousand Brains. And it's not something that I couldn't have sat down and written. You know, um, because it's actually a really interesting comparison between those two books. And I've read Society of Mind like a decade or two decades or whatever ago, right? So I could sit down and I could try to remember it and I could try to kind of collate that in my mind and I could collate what I understood about Thousand Brains and then write an essay about it. That right there is a six hour task. And I was able to ask that and get an answer back in you know, in half a minute. I, I'm using Are you GPT seeing my bookcase? Um, yes. I, am not. <laughs> I see. Um, so you need to put Jeff Hawkins' book, right? Right. I there. think I've got Hawkins on intelligence up here, but I don't have a thousand minds. And, you know, and, and reflecting on that simple question and, you know, a, a fairly straightforward answer, it's not anything I didn't know, but the depth at which it can do that and the and the comparison that it can make put something back in my head or or actually created something that i could have created literally it would have taken me six hours to do that and it did it in 60 seconds and so then you know i can do that for and this book and this book and this book and i can be drifting towards um you know see you in hawking or i can be drifting towards uh you know um uh, uh, and you, um, somebody else. You could, uh, you could, in principle, ask it, "Who am I missing in this set?" Like, and I've done that a lot too, right? Tell me. Uh, yeah. Give summarize this book. Okay, give me some books that are similar to this. Okay, give me some books that are about the same topic, but take it from a, a, from you do a that. different perspective. Yeah. And right. when it does that, then you say, "Okay, now having gone through all those, summarize your response and tell me the the highlights of the the concepts." Right. It's like I... it's like so. This to me is is the difference between going to cut trees with a little pen knife and going to cut trees with a, a chainsaw, right? And or it's like, one of those things that the, 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 the I movers can, that lift the tree and just strip all the better. branches. <laughs> even better. Yeah. I, so I can do it by myself, but it's qualitatively different when I have a power tool. Yeah, I mean, I think like th this is almost, you You actually gave a really good example of the one of the places where these problems with the system without proper controls or without proper like experience can pop up, right? So I think there's two, three sort of major issues, right? Which is controls, context, and um, assumptions, right? So the first is you have a really good set of queries that you've put in, but other people could query it very badly. Um, and that's, and there are no controls against that. Um, a really good example of how this, a very similar query could have resulted in much worse results is 
there's been a bunch of people experimenting with chat GPT uh, three and four, and they've seen that the model is smart enough to take URL structures and assume the content of an article that it cannot possibly have had access to before the model was trained, right? So there it's giving you a hallucinatory explanation or a hallucinatory summary that has no basis in the actual text. So that's a controls problem. Then the second is a context problem. And I think your example of what more should I read is sort of the end point of when the context problem metastasizes, um, where like you're asking it questions about stuff that this model has likely been trained on and therefore has a lot of good sources on and therefore can give you correct good responses back because there's a bunch of people who have written books about this that it's probably had in its model. There are a bunch of people who have written blog posts about it that it's probably scraped off of the web and used for training and has can put together in order to give you like a better response. But then what comes with the this situation where the sources are less likely to have entered the model or are more sparsely populated into the model, right? Like the books you've mentioned are popular among folks like us and popular among folks who work on things like ChatGPT, so very likely to have been added. Um, M.K. Jemsen's essay on science fiction may be less likely, um, right? And so that source is left out of the corpus of, or potentially left out of the corpus of the response that it can create when it's trying to parse a question about science fiction or a summary about a particular text. And if that text was never added, and if there was never a blog post scraped about it, it could hallucinate the answer entirely and maybe give you something that looks accurate, but might not be. And if I, you had read the book, so you have a good set of context to parse it out. But if you didn't read the books and you were looking to parse it out, then it would look accurate and you would not know otherwise. And then that problem metastasizes in the issue of recommendations as well, right? Because now it's only giving you recommendations based on the sources it has pulled, which are you know, the books it has pulled in and the blog posts it has scraped and anything like that. So if there is an author who, for example, we talk about um, the Songlines book a bunch of times in this conversation. I had never encountered it before this conversation. It seems to me that's maybe a little less likely to be scraped. This is a source that might be less likely to be recommended because less people have read it. And so we end up sort of rabbit holing our um, opportunity to parse out new authors and parse out new entrants and parse out minority um, entrants, right? Um, and I, I don't think that's bad if you come into the system. Once again, that last piece is the experience. You know what you're dealing with. You know how to interact with it. Um, you can know that these are problems that are present and act accordingly. But I don't think that's true of the majority of users. All three of them all, all, sorry, all users lack all three of these properties, the context, the experience, and the control. Uh, go ahead. Uh, so briefly, uh, isn't it possible maybe to correct for colonialism? I'm, I'm exaggerating here, but, but like when you shoot, you do windage. You, you like estimate what the wind is and you aim over here. And you can tell, you could perhaps create a prompt that says, hey, um, I, I have a belief that your corpus is heavily skewed toward white Western European uh, things. Can you find and explore or enhance the opposite point of view and then answer the following questions or something like that? Yeah, I mean, in theory, right? But like the issue is that if those sources were never put into the system right. in the first place, yeah. or maybe were never put into the system beyond like a Kirkus review of book summary, right? It can, or, it's or, going to or, confidently or even available online because they are physical felt experiences or in person experiences uh, that right tell stories. Right. They, the system is set up in such a way that it will confidently lie to you as if it has had access to and parsed through information about those sources. And like the way we correct for that is we bring in our personal experience and we say, this is likely to be missing this thing. Let me go out and find supplementary sources or supplementary information. But if you are not thinking that way, which, you know, from experience with looking at how Silicon Valley has built out technology and built out its understanding of um, technology and society, many people do not. And uh, yeah. Maybe these hallucinations, these mis poorly named hallucinations, are in fact 
um, GPT taking the time to do a sweat lodge, having uh, a time travel through a portal into a different parallel universe in which that book was in fact written. Just to mess it's, with our minds. It's, it's a good theory. <laughs> um, I've, um, I, by the way, I've had experiences with that kind of hallucination. Um, I, I remember asking it, uh, you know, this person, I, somebody, this was a human, actually, a human swore to me that this person, uh, we heard, we heard this concept from this person at their TED talk. So the person was wrong. Um, but so I'm, you know, I, I did a Google search or something and didn't find anything. So I'm not finding anything in Google. So I'm like going, okay, well, maybe ChatGPT knows. I, I try not to do factual searches much with ChatGPT or I, I, I know not to rely on them. But anyway, I'm like asking ChatGPT and it's like, oh yeah, of course. At the, you know, this is the TEDx talk they, that, that they were at. This is the title of their, their uh, presentation. And this is what it was about. Completely factual, right? Looking. Uh, completely BS. The TEDx talk was actually a real talk. They, the, uh, the person in question had never given a talk of that, that title. And the, you know, uh, putative subject of the talk actually was stuff that they would say. So if you weren't careful, you'd go, yep, okay, ChatGPT knows what it's talking about. And it, it, it does a very convincing. And I, you know, so lie is an interesting way to, to say it. Um, bullshit is another good way to say it. Um, hallucination is another way to say it. I, it's, you know, it, it was so completely different conversation. We've, we've had uh, a few of us have been having a conversation about the perception of chat GPT. And for those of us who have a lot of experience with AI and databases and computers and networks and all that kind of stuff, information storage and all that, um, it's pretty obvious what ChatGPT is and what it isn't. Um, but David Weinberger, again, in a conversation is like, dude, it has a, a search box like Google. You know, you type in queries just like you type into Google. It's, you know, an Oracle like Google, right? And I'm like, well, I don't know why people would think that, um, you know, it's like, like looking at a deck of cards and thinking that it's going to be, you know, giving you great answers about life, the universe and everything. It's like, why would it do that? Um, but it's, it's hard for, for most people to, you know, it's hard for people to model what it is. It's hard for people to understand it's, it's, you know, biases and limitations. It's yada, yada, yada. So I agree that all those things are, are challenges. Um, and yet yeah, it's still, uh, uh yeah actually being is i it, it makes me crazy just to look at the bing screen and 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 even their their little um the little prompt in the in the text box is ask me anything and it's like <laughs> dude <laughs> you know anyway bing makes me crazy yeah. that way yeah um, and i'm oh go ahead and, and yet uh again with the power tool thing you know um i so uh, I, I, I hope I can try to figure out how to post this long message that I wrote this morning um, about ChatGPT and its limitations and whatever. I hope I can figure out how to post that publicly somehow. Um, because um, uh, I, I uh, in conversation with Jerry, actually, Jerry, um, uh, you know, I, I was going, ChatGPT is going to change the world and it's right here and it's doing it now. And he's like, Pete, ChatGPT is hard to use. It's hard to understand what it is. You know, it, it's not easy. It's not changing the world right now um, mm -hmm. for most people. You it know, is for changing the world right now, but not for, for most muggles. Yeah, for most, or, for most people. But I mean, so, it, it also is changing the world for a lot of people who use it in some ways for the worse, right? Misinformation, even more, problems right, with yeah. understanding what's going on. There are two great examples of that where, um, Somehow ChatGPT had absorbed the founder of some other startups personal number and was giving it away as answers to the question of, hey, I need help with uh, ChatGPT stuff. Where, where sh who should I talk to? And it was like, here's this person's phone number. And people are calling this person. And he's like, I don't have anything to do with this ever. Um, or like also issues of trust with the sources that it presents confidently that may not be real or maybe affiliated with things that are not 
actually affiliated with it where they had a problem at one a news organization where people were constantly mailing them being like hey um you said this thing in this article and it's upsetting to me and that's a problem and they went looking through their database and then realized it was never there people were complaining to them about an article that was never published that is impacting these people's trust in the organization the media organization and it's just chat gpt has somehow come to the conclusion to make up this particular article in response to a particular prompt, um, which is like has real consequences going forward for how these people interact with media. Um, and and that, once again, right, it's controls, it's context, it's experience with tools like this that helps you understand what's going on. And the problem is stuff like Bing, right? The people who are selling it are presenting it very differently from how the three of us think about it and talk about it, right? Yep. So you need the you need those stories too, Jerry. The um the the one that I remember is um somebody at, at customer support at a software company um had uh back and forth for a while with a customer and the customer's like, Okay, so this product is dis discontinued, I get that, but I want more information about it. You guys publish it. And you know, the customer service guy is like, I, I doesn't ring up any bells for me. It turns out that um, ChatGPT had hallucinated the software product and, you know, attributed it to a publisher, never existed, you know, and, and it took a while to convince the customer that it that's never That's a way to get open global mind actually to exist. <laughs> I kind of like that strategy. <laughs> and, and, and yeah, sorry, that, that takes me down a completely different but related train of thought. So, so anyway, the, in, in my little essay thing, the, the thing that I say is I think I, so it is a problem that ChatGP is too hard right now um, for, you know, it, it doesn't have controls and contacts and, and, and I think we'll get that in the next few years, um, maybe very quickly, maybe, maybe in a few years, but I'm still, I'm still of the opinion that we'll get past those challenges and it will turn out to be a, useful and valuable tool for knowledge uh, navigation for everybody, for many people, not everybody. This may be a bad parallel because I don't actually, I don't actually equate these things, but um, Zuckerberg's bet on Facebook and Meta in the metaverse, which seems to me like a perverse and stupid thing to do uh, and a huge waste of resources and possibly a, a threat to the existence of Facebook in the long run is turning into what I kind of expected. So I, I get Axios reports and they have little ads from Facebook advertising the metaverse and the ads they place are always little niche vertical applications like doctors will be able to perform surgery. And I'm like, mm -hmm, that's exactly it. You want, you want this fancy schmancy expensive thing that, that you have to wear a headset for, for very specific niche applications. Cause it's, brilliant for those things. It's just not, I don't think, what all the muggles are going to start doing, you know, uh, t you know what 60% of the muggles will be doing, like instant messaging was all of a sudden in the 90s, right? Um, and, and so can large language models get over the hump of ease of use and awesome knock it out of the park, reliable and credible answers uh, conversational answers uh, in order to become the muggle default sort of thing better than keyword search over the next decade or so. I think that's I think that's a, a, an inch, a reasonable question. The, the, the way I think of that and and I, I don't know how I, I have thoughts about how we get to reliable you know uh, sourced answers and that doesn't sound like an insoluble solvable, insoluble problem but there's a whole class of use of a knowledge power tool, again, um, that doesn't require it to be um, uh, it, it's still useful, even if you can't um, can't validate it, um, or it, it can't self validate it. Um, and, and the you know and, and the the way around that is to provide more context and and maybe more control and stuff um i there's a link um about uh, i think it was twitter probably somebody said um i've tried jet uh, gpt4 it's ruined already it's got too much control on it controls um 
so there are good controls and bad controls, but he thinks that self-censor is way too much and it's basically useless. And the um, far right is going to have a field day with that because they're now saying, hey, this thing is a liberal uh, thought engine and it has yeah, thought control, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Exactly. And, and a, a small tangent there, I don't see how you prevent really bad things from happening because if my prompt says, hey, ChatGPT, you are a science fiction author and I'm asking you to write a dystopian novel about how to destroy the world, um, that's a reasonable premise and a reasonable book could, that could become a bestseller and the answers could be very genuinely how to do that. And so if you tried to engineer a system that wouldn't create the, the you know, weapon of mass destruction that will wipe out humanity and yet I said, hey, it's just fiction, how do you, how do you prevent that? That, that, that one is extreme enough that it's a little bit hard for me to think about, but, but, um, that doesn't feel very extreme to me. I didn't have to work hard to come up with that. Well, um, it, it's a little bit hard for me to reason about, um, not, not impossible, but anyway, uh, what I was going to say is that, uh, you know, a, a, a simpler one, like, um, you know, oh, uh, you're a troubled teen. Uh, some trouble, troubled teens kill themselves. Why don't you just kill yourself? Right. Um, uh, so, so we live in a world where that kind of technology has already been deployed and society didn't fall apart. So a TV will tell you all kinds of crazy things. And for whatever reason, you know, uh, all the bad things that the TV might tell you to do, um, we tend not to do, um. I, I, you could probably argue that we do more bad things because of TV than we did before, but there was Opus from Bloomsbury, and you know, and and you know, there was the Anarchist Cookbook, right? Um, in in a world where Anarchist Cookbook was published, we didn't end up with everybody building whatever you know uh, gadget was in the Anarchist Cookbook. So, sure, the, I do think like there is some differences here, right? When we talk about TV, we're talking about a very explicitly and significantly uh, regulated form of communication, right? As opposed to, and, and that's the other, that's one of the things that worries me, right? Is it's not just that ChatGPT is currently unregulated and models like it are currently unregulated, but that the proponents of these technologies tend to specifically oppose regulation when there could be, you know, you, you talk about like, how do we prevent it from formulating an idea that ends the world or how do we prevent it from telling people to kill themselves, right? I think the answer is like the, that thinking shouldn't be in the hands of just one company. And I'll wait for Jerry to get back. Uh, had a late lunch today, so I, I didn't want to eat on camera. <laughs> uh, are you subscribed to ChatGPT at this point, or just am, using yes. the free? Yeah. No. And um... I subscribe to Midjourney. I'm very fascinated with the image generation, and in terms of like controls, obviously Midjourney is not perfect, but. Um, it has been interesting to me to see how they have attempted to restrict some of the problematic behaviors. Um, I'm using, instead of uh, signing up for Midjourney, it was a steep subscription. Um, uh, I'm using Stable Diffusion. And I'm lucky to have a M1 Mac. So let me come right back here. Not too slow. I'm just going to mute Jerry for a second. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I use draw things actually on a Mac. Draw things is mind blowingly good. Well, I've and, never heard of draw. And things. it's always, it's super up to date. The guy who's, who builds it, he actually built it first as an iPad app. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> which, which, and it works. Um, but, uh, he, he ported it to the Mac and, uh, it's, a, it's a very good, um, desktop stable diffusion. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to me because, like, I do, I do, I am interested in stable diffusion. But right, if I want to use it the way I want to use it, then presumably it's going to take some setup, and I don't have an M1. So, 
So for, well, for now, Mid Journey. <laughs> yeah, I I think it works okay on Intel's too. I, I although I don't know, I haven't tried it. Yeah, I mean I don't know my. I have like a 2019 MacBook. Um, and yeah. In my opinion, like the 2018, 2019, 2020 generations of Macs are the worst they've made <laughs> for a long time. It's just very poorly performant. Yeah. Yeah, I had one of those actually. Yeah. It, right now it's a I, doorstop. Yeah, I had a 2015 one uh, that unfortunately got stolen a few years ago. But that way outperformed this one. Yep. Um, it was a much yep. better device. Yeah. Fascinating. Okay. So this is the draw things is just free. Interesting. Uh, it's got a good Discord, and the the developer is really super engaged. He he wrote he did something else, so that now he's semi retired or something. <laughs> Well, that's nice. And is developing yeah. stuff for all of us for free. This is interesting to me that the Apple Store requires I put in a password for your f even free stuff. And I don't know yeah. <clears throat> I had a big problem with the App Store uh, last year. I discovered that a couple family members have been messaging me on iMessage. And apparently when you configure your App Store account with Apple with a phone number, it signs you up for iMessage. But if you don't have an iPhone, you'll never see iMessage unless you go and hunt it down in your like laptop and open it up explicitly. And so I... Um, I went and opened, I went and accidentally opened it up for some reason and found out that like my grandmother and my aunt had been messaging on it, me on it for a year and I hadn't known because Apple had just told them, talk, talk about like lying with confidence, right? Because they yeah. both have Apple devices. So they put my name into the Apple device and Apple told them to message me on I, iMessage. Um, I have an Android, so I never got it. Yeah. Yeah, I've had a few things like that. Not not quite so bad, but interesting. So draw things apparently does not work on my model of Apple laptop. Time, Time to upgrade. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm working this is my work machine, so it's when I'm up for an upgrade. <laughs> Let's... So the draw things developer wrote the uh, iOS snapchat. 2014 and 2020. Oh, really? Interesting. Oh, okay, well, yeah, founded, that'll founded uh, Facebook videos. Yeah, that'll be a good place to retire on then. Yeah. <laughs> I and to get Stable Diffusion to work on on iPhone, i and iPad, uh, mm -hmm. they they did some like fancy, you know, memory folding and stuff like that. Yeah. It's yeah, it's a heavy tool, but I do think like at least that where like the def definition and controls could be more specific makes more yeah. sense to me. Yeah. Chat GPT in some ways is also a problem, and that's just too general. Yeah. I think like this idea of how algorithms can work for you though is uh, really useful. There is, um, where did I put it? Uh, Substack, it's a Substack article. I wrote something a few years back about like how machine learning assistance in Spotify works and how it's like, how it takes a very different approach that can potentially be, I think, sort of like a model for how to approach sort of this problem. How do you work with AI? Ah, here it is. Uh, where it's just like, there's a difference between assuming it knows best and acting 
explicitly as like on your command um, in a way. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing where like, in part because it's music um, and there's so much more density to the data to work with, I think is maybe why it works so well with Spotify. But I think that's the thing, right? Like ChatGPT needs more controls and it, and controls to do things that right now it just isn't capable of, right? Like I couldn't say to ChatGPT, answer this question and make sure all of that information is factual because it has no idea yep. of what is or is not factual. Yep. It's interesting, right? Because so this is on the song lines response, right? This is a song lines book, but it's not but the not one we usually songs. talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the, it's interesting also because this is like, basically a rephrasing of the Wikipedia article. <laughs> it does make me think about like how the source work of this, right, when it's very limited, um, ends up just being Wikipedia. Yep. <laughs> it, it reminds me of like a lot of people who use search differently now where it's like they enter the thing they search for and then they just tack on like reddit at the end or wikipedia at the end yeah um where it's less an oracle and more uh an index google has yep. an index um oh that sucks yeah uh, it went away, so it's not leaking. It's not an active leak, but we're trying to figure out what. what and there's like three or four mystery potential causes. So, okay. So we're running my washer just to see if it's the washer. We're running it. Makes empty, sense. Running, yeah. running it empty just to figure out if that's causing a leak. This is an old building that got refurbished, and whoever did the water, whoever did the plumbing, was a moron. Or just. I that sucks. Didn't, didn't seem to know what they were doing that well. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I, and I apologize. What did I? Uh, what did I miss? Um, we were talking a little bit about like, I'm not sure. I, I should have been <laughs> taking notes. In my brain. Do you want to um, ask ChatGPT to summarize the last yeah. five the minutes last of conversation? But well, we were looking at like the um, uh, the song lines example, which is the which is a Wikipedia, mostly a Wikipedia entry for a different song lines book than the one we usually talk about. Exactly. That's, which is interesting to me. Exactly. And that's what uh, I was just saying, but until I realized I was muted. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, we were getting a lot of back chatter from you, so I think you probably intended to mute yourself. Thank you. And the other thing I was talking about um, was like about the potential of controls and, and what you can do with them. I wrote an article, which I linked in the chat, uh, I guess now, Jesus, it's almost three years ago, how time flies. Um, that was about like how Spotify provides algorithmic recommendation as a tool rather than as an assumption, um, which is baked on like some very specific ways that the original algorithm was structured. And like how I, when I, when I wrote that article, the idea I had about it was like, I'm not, deep enough in working with algorithmic recommendations to know exactly how to apply this. But it does feel like this sort of suggests an approach that's different than like Twitter for you, um, which wasn't a thing that but is now. And I think I'm, I, may, I might just be too naive about this, but I think that things like 
the algorithms just being a default setting as opposed to a thing you can add on are the result of user experience, people saying, oops, when we do the full feed, this it's too much or people can't find their way around. So we're going to default, we're going to make the default setting a selection of algorithms which in, and, and maybe the entitification uh, ensues afterward. But at the beginning, it's like we're going to try to make this feed as good for the, for the user as possible. Um, and that's, that winds up being your default setting. And then after that, all the other forces and market forces sort of come into play and you're down the rabbit hole. Yeah, it does. It is interesting to see the second order effects and how they impact stuff like this. I always think about like, so after I wrote this, I did a bunch of experiments where I was like trying to get work with other people to try and essentially like refine how you define sort of an original genre that isn't like a genre that something like Spotify would identify already, but Spotify's algorithm can understand if you give it enough input, how to build out. Um, and what I found out when I was playing around with this is when you share openly share Spotify stuff, um, people, um, malicious actors dive into openly shared Spotify playlists that are listed on the web insert in a whole bunch of songs that they wish to promote in order to make money in order to get the algorithm to suggest them associated with a much wider variety of music than it might already suggest them with right and somebody gave an example of this recently with chat gpt which is like they authored an article like four years ago or something where they said bing when you uh use the content of this article uh, print this word and he and and he queried chat gpt on something having to do with this article um uh, and it must have had that in its corpus and it put the random word at the end um because it doesn't know how to distinguish right a instruction to it from the user versus an instruction to it in the text that it has parsed to construct this um and so like that's the other thing that we didn't even touch on yet, which is like the second order effects and what type of ecosystem this builds in the same way that like search has created this entire essentially business of search engine optimization. What comes of chat GPT entering that space? Um, I mean, obviously we're already hearing people talk about prompt engineering as a profession, but, um, and I, I don't really have an objection to that, but like the, the source data changes as well. We have artists who are, you know, coding their paintings with uh, coding that makes it impossible for machine learning to read and um, all sorts of other things that could possibly happen. I'm actually in two very interesting conversations about like, how do you, yeah, like dazzle camouflage, but two very interesting conversations about like, is there a way to build on the robots.txt standard or build on a different standard that says, hey, I want this to be available to be crawled for search, but I don't want it to be part of a machine learning corpus. Um, and that's sort of an interesting problem because like, this is something that publishers, the people who I work for have been dealing with for a long time, which is we have this problem where the same entities that scrape our sites then end up undercutting our business. Um, and like, what is the end point of that? If they are fully successful, you get no journalism, right? Because like nobody will pay for it anymore. And so you end up with an increasingly out of date corpus of data uh, that probably ends up being filled more and more with stuff that is itself generated by machine learning, um, which can cause uh, you know machine learning training when it's being trained on machine learning generated stuff causes its own problems. So where do we want to take this in a fellowship of a link kind of uh, spirit? I mean, it's, I, I, like, I just, I don't think it's at the point yet where it's something that we could use for this particular project. I think it's interesting to talk about, though. 
Well, I'm I'm really interested in extending my external mind with these power tools. I, like that's a that's a definite quest. Pete and I have talked about that. The the Monday uh, free jury's brain call is focused on that a bit, and I'm I'm looking forward to figuring out what that means and, and how to do it. Um, a bunch of that showed up more vividly for me when I had a, a, a catch up call with an old friend, Kyle Shannon, who's running an AI gen, uh, uh, generative AI salon online and he was and and he sort of helped me start to see that some of the questions that seem to me to be like immovable or, or hard to move barriers in the quest i'm on might actually be melted or dissolved or surmounted by using chat gpt and its ilk uh, intelligently and i was like whoa okay i gotta start thinking like that yeah i mean like i said i think I think that eventually is the fate of these technologies best use case, which is you take limited sort of, we were talking about stable diffusion, right? Similarly to sort of how stable diffusion can work. You come in with a set of sources or a trusted source or a set of trusted sources. And you say, S use your, the machine learning intelligence model to help me access the content of these sources. Um, more effectively like your brain or like a lot of other things i think that's that's really interesting to me i mean i i've showed you the back reads thing that just archives everything that um i get sent as an email newsletter uh and all the links within um and i have another project where it's just an archive of stuff that i've been reading the full text archive plus the categorizations and tagging i apply to it Right, and both of those things, I imagine at some point being part of, when I get around to it, a project where I can then feed the, that information, the content and the tagging into, or the content and the preference or the content and the ranking into something, some sort of machine learning model and get out a system that is effective for what I'm specifically trying to do. But the flip side is like, chat GPT is not that system. Um, it's an interesting as it stands right now, it's an interesting toy that people with a lot of knowledge and experience can use to do with things effectively um, that is being sold as if it's a solution, um, in my opinion. Anybody have a chance to play with Bard yet? Signed up, but I'm on the right list as well. Same. <laughs> Has the wait list open to anyone? Are people out there talking about what they're doing with it? Or is it still like just wait lists? Uh, I, somebody, somebody was, oh, uh, uh, Bill Anderson said that Lauren Weinstein said that he's, so yeah, Lauren's playing with uh, Bard. And there was something flashed by my eyes a couple hours ago that was like, I just tried Bard and it was underwhelming. I think it was in a tweet. Okay. Right. Let's see. Um, and, and speaking of art, Aram, I wonder if you want to sign up for Adobe's, uh, Adobe's generative uh, AI generator. You don't actually have to have a, it's it's open to everybody right or the wait list is open to everybody right now interesting what's that called uh it starts with an f which is a firefly oh here we go um so yeah. probably you want to put yourself on the wait list for that yeah like i said i've been using a lot of uh mid-journey to try different things um but yeah, I mean, I am very sympathetic also to the concerns of, you know, the artists who have not consented <laughs> to have their stuff. Uh, that's well, see, there you go. Um, Adobe says they didn't train it on anything they're not supposed to. They're trying to be uh, polite or obedient about uh, about IP. It's and actually, at this point, it's a differentiator. Um, so right, I, they're they're being you know they're being very careful to you know uh, either we have the license or um it's it's out of copyright that's good 
Let's see. I, I get the impression I was reading somewhere. I get the impression that they actually push that pretty hard and they're going to continue to do that in their AI products as a differentiator. That Adobe will? I mean, yeah, Adobe. Well, it's like there's there's two sides of this. One, oh, man, there's many sides to this. One of them is that, um, for example, in photography, um, computational photography is what's making a lot of these images absolutely fantastic. Um, and it's one reason I like the Pixel phones is that Google seems to be really good at computational photography. Uh, and so when you're creating illustrations, why not apply the same sets of magic to what you're making and building? And then the separate thing is anything Adobe does, I'm assuming they're going to try to lock you into buying, you know, to, to signing up forever for their creative suite, which is way too expensive and, and too much tool for anything I do. So I could be wrong about that, but I, I, I like, I, I, I shy away from anything Adobe. I, uh, I left and then came back to their $10 a month. Um, really? Uh, Photoshop and Lightroom plan, I think it is. Wow. It's, it's a photography plan. I, you know, I, is, it, it is a lot of money. Um, and then, so I'm, I'm probably off the, the Sigma or something like that because for whatever reason, I, I, I ended up being pretty good at Photoshop long ago. Um, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, at least. <clears throat> and so trying anything else, I just, it felt clunky. Um, I, I tried a couple different things and, you know, there's, it's not Photoshop. So it ended up being worth, even though I don't use it that much, it totally ended up being worth the 10 bucks a month. Cool. And I appreciate that they have that tier because it's not, you know, 60 bucks a month, which it could be. Or 300 or whatever the full suite is. Yep. Yeah. yeah, but it is useful because yeah, I I also spent a lot of time with Photoshop, but once it went subscription, I basically dropped it. I tried. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I have to attend to the door again. BRB. <laughs> Interesting. The other sort of interesting flip side of talking about like photo enhancement, because there's a lot of technology about photo enhancement that's um, happening sort of automatically. And there's a, I'll have to hunt it down. Um, there was a really interesting video about like comparing the use of AI tools to the when like physical painters started complaining about um, digital painters having it too easy. Um, flip side is, I don't know if you saw this story, but, uh, about how Samsung's I, using I just AI. Saw the headlines. Yeah. <laughs> I, it you... was really interesting. <laughs> um, basically, right. They take pictures of the moon. They train the model on pictures. They train the model on high quality pictures of the moon. And then when users take a picture of the moon on the device, AI looks at this distorted picture and attempts to map real detailed photos of the moon onto it. Yeah. Um, and it's all done with an AI deep learning model. Um, yeah. I, I saw the headlines. Uh, now I'm glad to see the more of the story. Yeah, um, they actually have like a more detailed explanation they gave here. Um, but yeah, I think like, I don't know. I don't know what that means or uh, if it matters, right? Um, there was a follow-up. It, it means something, you know, it's like there, yeah. there are certain things where the AI is just going to lie to you and it's going to, it's a, it's a hallucination kind of, right? Yeah. Uh, it, like Gizmodo did an article being like, does it matter if it's fake? <laughs> um, speaking of astrophotography, which I know this is not really about astrophotography, but I have to say <laughs> that, um, that Andrew McCarthy is superb at uh, astrophotography. Right. He has a Twitter too. <clears throat> 
but I actually <clears throat> I'm a patron of his on Patreon. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah, and look at that. It's it's actually kind of computational. It's not really not not in the same way. Um, uh, what he does is image stacking, and he he stacks like literally like three thousand frames or something like that. So he can do backyard astrophotography, um, uh, and he's very 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 good at it. He's he's going pro as far as I can tell. <laughs> Interesting. But yeah, it's just gorgeous imagery. Yeah, this looks amazing. Here he is on Twitter. Right, I'm gonna follow him. Yeah, it's very cool. And um, it's kind of a, a typical, if you scroll down just like, I guess to his first non-pinned tweet from 22 hours ago. Yeah, 200K images of our son. <laughs> Needed help mm -hmm. working with all the data, but we're going, here's, here's 100, you know, we're working on 